Hello, all you beautiful souls. Thank you for joining me for another edition of Operation Tango Romeo, the trauma recovery podcast for veterans, first responders, and their families. But as my longtime listeners know, that's not all I do. It's not just the veteran first responder crowd. Uh, Now, myself and my guest were talking off air about ACEs scores. For those that don't know, because we'll bring this into the conversation, ACEs is adverse childhood events, so childhood trauma. And there is a direct correlation between those that choose the helping uh, services or uniform services, people that cho- that choose a trauma-rich environment, and ACEs scores. So if you're working in the emergency room or you're working in some sort of support capacity or you've decided to join the military or police or EMS, chances are that your ACEs scores are above average, above the national average. And... Why is that? I don't know. But me and Wanda are going to talk about it and and much, much more. The reason I had um, reached out to bring Wanda on the on the show is to talk about little warriors. Wanda, thanks for joining me. So, thanks so much. Thanks, Mark, for having me. Awesome possum. So the your first foray into little warriors, how did you uh, connect with the organization and how did that evolve? Well, I knew about Little Warriors because it previously I was a clinical director at um, a mental health organization for children, youth and families. And so we in that service, we provided a trauma service for trauma and attachment. And there was just sort of a natural connection for me to know about Little Warriors because of the childhood trauma and the sexual abuse component. So we had collaborated a little bit and our founder, um, Glory Meldrum, for anyone who knows Glory, Glory is a fierce advocate of children and youth. And she herself, her story is that she um, was sexually abused by her grandfather as a child. And I'm sure that you know her ACEs score is quite high um, and she's she's pretty vocal about this but she's also a very fierce advocate and started Little Warriors founded the program and we've over the last seven years that I've been here we just can continue to um, develop our program and supports for children and youth and families who have a sexual abuse trauma history and related to your ACEs um, discussion is that obviously um, child sexual abuse is one of the original um, questions in the ACE questionnaire. One of the things, uh, I'd love to have you comment on it. One of the things I've been noticing is the cognitive dissonance of the general public towards childhood sexual abuse and rape, child rape and um and child sex, tra- sex trafficking. Recent uh, Last year, the Sound of Freedom came out and people are, ah, it's a conspiracy theory. It's like, yeah. no, this, this this is real. It happens. It's on an industrial scale. Um, what do you think that is? Like, is that just cognitive dissonance because it's too horrible to believe so people just don't? Yeah, I I think that's a lot of it, Mark, honestly. Um, I think people have a very hard time connecting the fact that these atrocities could happen or if people connect to it, they sort of connect to it in a way that, oh, that happens, you know, in another country where people are very poor or very uneducated. Um, When the fact of the matter is, is that it happens right here in Canada and the United States um, and the frequency is very hard to believe. I mean, the, the latest stats um, on this is um, by the time a girl um, reaches the age of 18, one in three, um, some stats say one in four girls um, have been sexually assaulted. And for boys, it's one in six boys. And so um, to think of that in a classroom of like 30, um, that there's, you know, potentially five or six, um, seven kids in a classroom, um, that that is sort of mind-blowing. It doesn't seem possible, um, but it is happening. There's no question about it. I think a lot of it is the the incredibly powerful stigma 
that that comes along with it, which is why like, the only way to combat stigma is just to say it, recover out loud, you know, just, just say it, not say, say, to, it's like, Hey, oh, look at me. I'm a victim. Not at all. It's just to say, look, this happens, which yeah. is why uh, like I wasn't able to tell anybody that I was molested as a kid until I was like 48. Yeah. Oh, and the first person I ever told was my wife. And now I say it on the show all the time, but I say it on purpose, with purpose. I yeah. was molested by an older family member from the age of seven to 12. Yeah. Seven years old. And then when you meet a seven year old, you're like, oh my freaking goodness. Like, yeah. how, how could that happen? And how horrendous is that? Because a lot of times, those of us that it happens to, it doesn't feel like trauma at the time. Mm hmm. You know, it's not until you look back in the rearview mirrors like, oh, wow, that train wreck of a life, all these um, <laughs> antisocial behaviors, that's all from that. Yeah, there's definite connections. And, oh, man, Mark, I'm so glad you're bringing this out and talking about it and, and you know, being vulnerable and brave. And Well, that's um, just it. it. Like, Wanda, I don't think it should be brave. And the, the, yeah. the more calm it is, the more common it is, the less brave it is. Right. Like, absolutely. Like what's going to happen to me by saying the truth? What's going to happen? Are they going to take away my birthday? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> somebody going to make fun of me, you know, is somebody that evil to make fun of somebody that that happened to? Yeah. But you know what, especially when it happens at a early age and, you know, the data around this is that boys um, sort of the the average age of a boy being sexually abused is around nine years old. And for mm. girls, it's a little bit older. Um, the average age is, is about 11. Um, but when you're being or having mm. had um, sexual abuse history, there's a lot of things around that. You're right. Like as a child, um, it's hard to sort of understand that that's abuse or understand what's happening. And there's a lot of myths and a lot of things that people um, don't understand. And it's important to talk about it for sure. But as a child, you are felt to fear um, something. You you kind of are also having had that, especially when there's been somebody in your family or a close family member, which, by the way, um, is most common. It's not sort of that mm -hmm. stranger danger that previously people had taught. 95% um, of child sexual abuse offenders um, are known to the child and are supposed to be people in their lives that they would think of as safe people. Um, but when you're a child and you're experiencing that, there's something internal that you feel is not right or when, you know, otherwise you wouldn't hold on to it and and not talk about it until years and years later. And you're right. You know, your story is very similar to so many of um, the children and teens and families that we work with at Little Warriors in that you know, they have held on to their stories. They have not spoken up. They have some fear. Sometimes there's also, um, you know, fear of being hurt or fear that their family will be hurt because that's part of the abuse and trauma. So there's so many factors. Um, but yes, I'm glad people are talking about it. And I think that, you know, society is changing and people are talking about it. You know, um, I think about like the Me Too movement and whatnot, and I think that was a great movement to bring things forward. But the 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 issue for me um, working in this field is that when we think of Me Too, we don't think about children. We think about you know primarily women. Um, we don't think about you know men. Um, in the Me Too movement as much. And so, again, it's sort of um, created some beliefs, some myths that the Me Too and sexual abuse only happens to women. And that's just not the truth. With men, because there's been three instances in, in my life where uh, what you could call a sexual abuse has happened and at three different phases. 
and it's uh, it's so emasculating when it happens to a, to a man. And of course, you know, I'm a, I'm a tough guy. I was a soldier, and so that that patina, you don't want to let go of that. So people just keep it to themselves, and and that's because they somehow feel that if they speak out, it's going to make them seem weaker, or mm-hmm one of the benefits of how where society has gone is that nobody gives two hoots if somebody's gay or not so uh, i remember that being a real struggle for me is like well am i gay or something because that was a bad idea in the 80s <laughs> you know no. like, yeah. if so, like if somebody wouldn't want to come out of the closet then it wouldn't have been very easy right. but um so i was very concerned about that 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 might be the case oh my gosh you know maybe i'm gay which I'm not, but uh, that's that's part of the blast radius that is created by by childhood sexual trauma. You these are questions that that, that you struggle with because this happened, and um, and in the military, you know, I was uh, I was jumped by five guys, and uh, they they tore everything off me and stuck a uh, vacuum cleaner on me. And they thought it was hilarious. I didn't think it was hilarious. I can't remember a time in my life where I've ever fought harder or been angrier, you know, and, um, but they thought it was hilarious, Mm -hmm. but there's cultural shifts where people are like, ah, I don't think that's funny. I don't think that's hazing or indoctrination. Like that's not okay. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Cause I remember them uh, saying too, like, what's the big deal, man? It's just a joke. I'm like, yeah, it's not a joke. Yeah. (laughs) You know, you took all my power from me. I was screaming to stop and you didn't, you assholes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's um, because the reason I tell that particular story isn't to make it about me, but I tell that particular story because these things happen and nobody ever talks about them. But because I've said that one story about the vacuum cleaner that was, and it hurt. (laughs) That was not a good time. Um, I've had people come to me and tell, and I was the first person in their life that they ever told about something similar that happened to them in the military. Never told a soul. And that's the power of just telling your story and and doing doing it without any shame. Yeah. I think, you know, Brene Brown talks about that power of vulnerability um, to be able to speak up and to own your story. And and I love that. And Mark, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. But, um, you know, that was was the last one. So (laughs) there there, there's three times. But uh, that that was the last one in basic training. So I'm glad it hasn't happened since. But it, it puts me in a position now where I get to tell that story. What a privilege it is to help other people. By saying, yes, this happened. It was freaking wrong. It's not my fault. What am I going to do? Fight off five guys? You know, there's there's nothing I can do. It's yeah. just, it's something that happened. It was completely out of my control. I fought as hard as physically possible. But the, but it, it is common. So for everybody else that this has happened to or something similar, it's okay if it bugs you. That, oh, that's I- okay. Because it or- was wrong. Yeah. Well, and, you know, the things that you're talking about in terms of your experience, a friend of mine, Dr. Kelly Pelfi, has actually written a book um, called Men Too. And she Mm -hmm. talks about a lot of the, um, you know, myths about sexual abuse um, with and and for men and um, also about kind of these cultural effects um, on sports teams and um, in the military and in the police force. Um, So, you know, there are these cultural um, places that it has been sort of okay or or at least non-spoken okay to be doing hazing or to have sort of this cultural of very toxic masculinity. Um, You know, obviously, just in the news last week, probably the the biggest event that kind of highlights this is Hockey Canada. And um, I mean, in a different way, but that the hockey players have been, you know, found to be um, responsible for an event that happened five years ago. And, you know, there is and there needs to be cultural shifts that happen. But, you know, even looking at that event, there was enormous amount of cover-up to not talk about it or to really support 
that cultural negative cultural aspect within you know uh, the game of hockey and hockey canada and um it's a similar similar culture to um because it's aggressive you know you're you're there's fighting in hockey it's aggressive it's tough and it's it's a bunch of very fit men all together so it, yeah. it's a similar similar culture to the military yeah yeah I, um, I and maybe you can, um, set me straight, but I really resist the term toxic masculinity. And, and this is why I resist it because to me, it conflates toxicity and masculinity as opposed to two separate things. Um, for myself, what I'm hearing is that being a man is bad when I hear that term. Uh, and that's why I push against it, or I have some resistance to it. Uh, I understand, I think, what it, what it's meant to say, but masculinity is it's not a bad thing. And uh, femininity is not a bad thing. They're both essential to how the world works. And they, they both are bedrock pillars of society, both things. Um, but anything can be taken too far. So uh, the, like the hazing and all that, I don't see that as being masculinity at all. I see that as being, have nothing to do with masculinity, maybe testosterone, but it's, uh, it, it's just right and wrong. If it's toxic, it's wrong. Yeah, fair. I, I know. I, am I thinking about it uh, the wrong way? What, what do you no, think? No, you know what, Mark? I agree with you. I think the term, I, I guess for me, I don't think about it as all masculinity is being toxic. I think there's yeah. a toxic femininity too. Um, you know, I don't think that it just applies to males or, you know, men in particular. I think, you know, the term um, that gets used, I think just identifies kind of that um, that perspective of, you know, sexualizing certain behaviors or, um, you know, that aggressive, that tox toxic, aggressive behavior. See, because we, 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 we just call them douchebags. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Douchebaggery. I think that's so, a, it's a more on the nose term. Toxic yeah. uh, masculinity. Uh, I call them douches. <laughs> well, but even that, right? I think, you know, that term for me, I, I think of men for some reason. I don't know why, but I think that that term could apply to, you know, other people um, who aren't men either. And I don't know what the term would, well, I do know what the term is, but I won't say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I like douche. It, it seems, it just seems to, it's got that uh, onomatopoeia almost. <laughs> it just seems to hit the, hit the nail on the head. Um, how widespread, I, I really saw when the Sound of Freedom came out, the cognitive dissonance was massive. Mm -hmm. um, and, and all these news anchors across the board saying, oh, a conspiracy theory. And um, just, but never saying, okay, it's not this big of a problem. It's this big of a problem. Like they, they would never put a size or scale to it. They would just say conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a segment of the, of the progressive population that I have witnessed who inadvertently, not on purpose, but inadvertently through their actions and, and through their, the way that they cover the news are actually without knowing it, supporting child sex predators. They're supporting child rape by not calling it out. If you're yeah. not calling it out, or if you're using euphemisms, you're supporting it. If mm -hmm. you're saying it's a small problem, when that is not the case, it is an industrial size problem. It's like a $50 billion industry in the U.S. alone. The U.S. are the number one consumers of uh, of, of child sex, um, porn of, uh, uh, of sexual trafficking. They're the number one consumers in the world is, is in the U S. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's massive. And because it's so if, like, if you are not yourself a sexual predator, it's just, it is so hard to believe that a grown man would rape a five-year-old. Yeah. But I, I think a lot of it is the, is the language that we use. We like, 
within the support communities uh, and within your communities uh, because it is so bloody heinous. We don't call it for what it is. Uh, mm -hmm. Our mutual friend, Theo Fleury, uh, when he started doing his talks, I heard one of his early talks and he called it uh, sexual abuse. Well, he changed uh, a couple of years later. He just calls it for what it is. When yeah. I was raped, mm -hmm. raped by my coach 150 times, but it, it took him a few years of, of speaking before he could say it like that. But that's what it is. Mm -hmm. How important, like, how, how much have you seen? Like, is it is it just me? Are you also seeing this cognitive dissonance? This, uh, and what do you think is the is the solution? Like, how does what I'm saying land with you? I do agree with you. I, I think that uh, because it's unfathomable to hear that there's people who do sexually abuse children. Uh, and yes, I think language is important. I think sometimes um, just from, you know, my perspective being trained in therapy and counseling, sometimes you know, sometimes we don't use the harsh language of saying child rape because it it can be very startling to people and it should be startling, but sometimes um, it's it's too much for people to take in and it can be very triggering. And so, you know, I, I think it depends on the I, I, But if we don't, what's, look, look at the effects. If we don't, people, that cognitive dissonance is just so much easier for people to go, well, they were just fiddled with, yeah, or some, I, or or I, some euphemism. Yeah, I I hear you. I mean, we do interchange the language. Um, I do think, obviously, saying child rape definitely hits home more in terms of the impact that people kind of hear that with and process that with. And you're right; it's important to to do that. Um, you know, with the, with regard to the sound of freedom, we actually Paul Hutchinson is one of the creators and was involved in um, the the actual um, protecting and and going into the uh, different countries um, to rescue some of the children who were impacted by um, exploitation. And he's actually going to be a speaker at our Little Warriors luncheon um, in May. Uh, I've had the opportunity of, of hearing some of his podcasts and speaking with his wife. And um, it's, it's unfathomable for people to understand that this is happening and the extent that it's happening and um you know my my counterparts that i have some friends in the rcmp and in the um ice units across canada the information that they are gathering not only across canada internationally um as well is is just unbelievable there's a whole underground market for um child sexual um abuse material and um it it i think for the general public it's hard to believe it because you know how or why would somebody ever want to do this but as you mentioned it is a billion dollar industry um and you know i don't even think we have a, even a good sense of that the amount of information and the amount of material that gets sent through the internet um is... through the dark web and whatnot and but exactly. and some of it some of it's right in front of your face like it's it's on yeah. facebook but there's these codes that people ah oh, it's a conspiracy theory no yeah. it's not uh like people say pizzagate is a conspiracy theory well maybe pizzagate uh wasn't exactly correct but the idea of it happens all the time like the representation of pizzagate is 100 real if that in that that particular in instance Maybe it was real, maybe it wasn't. I don't know. I've never gone down the rabbit hole. But the idea of Pizzagate is complete. Mm -hmm. It happened. It's common. It happens in plain sight with these code words all over the time. Am I wrong about that? No, I agree with you. And this this comes across in so many ways that I don't think people are even aware of um, or even recognize. So, you know, as simple as things like, you know, there's, 
these little dolls. Um, I'm not going to name them because I, I don't really want to bring more attention to them, but little dolls that, you know, little girls and boys might be interested and play with. And they, um, if you put them in water, um, they actually turned to have like um, fishnet stockings on their legs and very sexualized. And so there are subtle ways that this happens, um, but there's also, you know, um, very clear in in our sight that we kind of turn our our turn a blind eye to. Um, this this is happening on a day to day basis, and you know you can't avoid the fact that in our country alone, uh, you, you cannot on a day-to-day -day basis find in every single province and every single city, there are um, things in the news, outright in the news, that there are sexual offenders being released or there have been sexual assaults on a day-to-day -day basis many, many times. One of the things I want to talk about, um, and I would really like to have you explain it is grooming. So I want to talk about grooming so that people can see it. Um, so they can understand it, help protect their children when grooming is started. So what is it? What does it look like? How can you spot it? Uh, what are the, some of the hallmarks of it? Cause I remember when I was groomed, um, before I was molested for the first time when I was seven, I remember the process and now in hindsight, I understand why I was vulnerable to it. So I will explain what happened to me and what the grooming process was, what the verbiage was and why I was vulnerable and why I fell for it. Um, and, and then I'm, I'm going to ask you to sort of comment on if that's typically how it, how it is or what it looks like. And just before I do uh, for the audience, I, I take the gloves off on this topic. Like I need you to know everybody that's listening that, like how bad is it? Five-year-olds get raped. And in some cases, infants have died from rape. Infants, six months old, have died from internal injuries because of rape. That's how sick and twisted this is. It happens. And that's the burden of first responders and people in this space is that they know that what I'm saying is true because they've seen it. They've responded to this as part of moral injury and um, the burden of being a first responder is that they know these things. And just like World War II veterans or combat veterans of my vintage, you know, we don't typically talk about the war because we can't, we, we know that you won't get it. You know, mm -hmm. somebody asked me, well, tell me what it's like in a war. You're not gonna get it. <laughs> like you're not gonna understand. But we have to try with this topic to protect the kids. And we got to talk about it in a very open, honest way, I believe. So the grooming process. Now, for me, um, I, I like to say that I was raised by wolves. And when I write my next book, that's probably going to be the opening line. I was raised by wolves. And, and what I mean by that is that I was provided food and shelter and clothing. Everything else, I raised myself. There was no guidance. There was protection and, and food and transportation, but there was no guidance. There was, uh, I was a free range child and I, and I raised myself. So I, I learned from those that were around me. And unfortunately, so I was looking for a father figure. I was looking for somebody to teach me, to guide me. Um, because I didn't have that. I didn't have a dad that that was in that father role. He was just the provider and, the, and that that was it. Um, so because of that, I was wide open to anybody filling that role. And just like a, a somebody that's walking in the desert, any drink of water that you could get, you'll, you're going to take, you know? Um, so that person was a family member, a few years older than me, who uh, even no, it's just a, just a, like a, oh, a three-year gap. That was enough because you were the older, wiser person who knows about life and uh, whatever you say, I'm like, I'm just so glad that I have somebody to guide me through this life. And when that person knew that he was in that position of authority over me, so he might as well have been 30 years old. 
<laughs> you know. <clears throat> but either way, there was a position of authority there. So once that was established, the I remember the conversation, even though I was only seven. It's like, hey, you know, isn't this great? We're so tight. We're so we're so close with each other, and uh, we're like brothers. And you know, there's a way that we can be even closer, and that this special relationship can be even more special. And what we do is uh, we touch penises, and. Uh, well, I'm, I'm getting some feedback. That's from your side, Wanda. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Now you're back. But uh, without getting in, into more of the details, but the molestation started. And, and, and it didn't start, but, but it started with a story. A story of this is a special bond. It's like a secret handshake kind of thing. You know, it's like an exclusive club. But this is like, if we're really going to be tight, if we're really going to be close to each other, this is how you do it. But of course you can't tell anybody. Otherwise it's not a secret club, you know, so you can tell no one, uh, but this way, this would be our little secret. And, and we're going to be so close to each other because of that. Well, I thought it was pretty, I remember, I, I remember the original was like, that's pretty weird, dude. Like, uh, but you talked me into it over a course of, cause it, it wasn't all at once. Right. It was over the course of weeks and several exposures. But eventually I went, well, I don't understand that, but you're my guide. You're the one that knows I'm not. So if you tell me that this is how we do things, I guess this is how we do things. Freaking weird, but okay. And that went on until uh, I was 12 when I finally said, this isn't right for me. Uh, no. And, and that was it, right? That affected my whole life. And everything about my life and uh and my uh like it a significant negative impact on my life and the lives of uh of others around me because of uh my moral compass was way off as a result so taking that like from there as sort of a baseline please tell me uh, if that is fairly typical grooming or what are the hallmarks of grooming what does it look like and uh, how can parents avoid it or spot it or catch it early on? Yeah, well, I would say that, um, unfortunately, your story is pretty typical, Mark. Um, what I can say is that a lot of times grooming doesn't just start with the child. It uh, actually can start with the parent or parents mm. ahead of so we see a lot of um, situations where you have a single parent. Um, it can be, you know, a, a single dad or a single mom. And that there's somebody who sees that vulnerability. Maybe they need to work at certain times and they need a babysitter or they need, you know, someone just to sort of fill in or need a break. Um, and so, you know, we see a lot of that. Um, unfortunately, a lot of single moms who um, have boyfriends um, or partners that they, um, you know, bring into their life um, who become um, the abusers of uh, their children. Um, you know, with grooming, like you mentioned, it isn't just, uh, it's, it can be a pretty slow process and it can actually take years and years. But the, you know, the key indicators that you're bringing forward is that there does tend to be some kind of a power differential. Maybe that power differential is that, you know, the, it could be another child or another, um, a, a person who is kind of cool or seems like, yeah. you know, here, I'm going to start the grooming process by, unfortunately, kind of exposing you to little things, maybe here's a little bit of alcohol, or try a cigarette or a vape. Um, or here's some, you know, sexually explicit material that I want to show you pushing the um, boundaries in any way. Yeah. And so, you inch. know, you got it. And, and, you know, in some ways, you know, for children or teens, you know, there's a certain amount of just natural curiosity. Um, but as soon as there's any sort of 
situation that happens, a lot of children, a lot of teens feel kind of a, a, some level of shame or some level of, hmm, this isn't right. And they feel kind of a part of this process um, where a lot of blame, feelings of blame can come in because of the manipulation that happens. Um, but oftentimes it it you know takes a little bit of time um they sort of create like yours talking about a special relationship and um you know eventually try things out so you know very rarely is it just immediately you know abusing the child uh or teen it it's trying little things out and um you know when you look at the research on this they're trying things out to see like you said the level that they can push the boundaries and you know if a child then speaks up about it they can say oh that must have been a mistake it's it's sort of like you know um not as outwardly uh offending uh, in in nature so they're they're sort of checking checking it out um also just playing doctor yeah playing doctor we often hear playing hide and seek and then there's touching that happens and you know the child is kind of like uncomfortable but they're kind of think oh was that just an accident um but when nothing gets said then then the next step is a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more so that's often what we're seeing um online it's similar it's it's you know through gaming platforms um through online gaming where a lot of children and through the pandemic we saw an increase and i think that the last stats that i um heard about there's a 1400 percent increase in child exploitation online sexually since the pandemic and and it starts pretty like innocuous it's it's like um hey we're friends online this is exciting but you and, and the child thinks oh this is you know a, another buddy my age or someone kind of my age um but they are you know not their age and they begin to establish this relationship and similarly you know show me a picture of you and i'll show you a picture of me not identifying that they're you know 50 years old or um you know that they're living in a different place and and a child just doesn't have that information so going back to your question about you know what are the things that parents should know well parents should be um very aware that there are platforms um through gaming through things like roadblocks through minecraft through you know things that parents wouldn't necessarily be thinking about um a lot of offenders uh, are looking for children online who seem to be you know more vulnerable than others um and making sure that you know, they don't have private accounts and whatnot. So parents to really educate themselves on, you know, checking into these platforms, checking on their child, having open conversations about um, the myths, making sure that, you know. And uh, gifts, they, right? Like, it, you, like, like, like if it starts online and then there's an in-person meeting and then it starts with gifts. So yep. if you're, if you're, if your child starts coming home with stuff, Oh, I, I, I was I found it lost and found or or whatever bullshit that they're going to come up with. So yeah. like uh, like suddenly new shoes or a jacket or you know yeah. it's like where the hell did you get that? Yeah, or different sort of changes in behavior too in terms of like not wanting to go to school. Your your comment about gifts online, the gifts can be oh I'll buy you tokens oh, for shit, the yeah. Yeah, so it it can be um, very, very manipulative and seeming, you know, not, you know, something that is initially sort of a negative relationship, but 
parents and caregivers really do need to be on top of this. Um, you know, just for any parents or caregivers or adults out there who are wanting to understand this more, we actually have a free um, prevent it workshop through Little Warriors. We have uh, volunteers all across the country and um, they are trained to deliver in person prevent it. Um, information and there's a certificate that gets attached to that or online it's a 90 minute course and you can just sign up and there's a lot more information about grooming and about the impacts of um, different sort of special relationships and what to look for because offenders um, you know will go through so many um means and look for ways to be in positions of power. Uh, previously, you know, we would see that with scouts or um, with teachers or, well, you know. There's, there's a new way that, uh, and I'm feeling anxiety even bringing the topic up because it's uh, it's verboten to even bring it up anymore. But uh, our, our progressive media is promoting uh, uh, what I think is grooming, and please correct me if I'm wrong. So uh, I'll give you a couple of scenarios that are they've been in the news lately. And if there's a legitimacy to these scenarios, where like, no, no, that's that's fine, and this is why it's fine. Please educate me. And but if but if you because uh, uh, it looks like grooming to me, it looks okay. like predator. It looks like predators to me. So one that Rebel News keeps covering is uh, this fifty, a roughly fifty-year-old um, man who's now a trans woman. Um, so fifty, swimming with twelve-year-old girls in the tr in the change room with twelve-year-old girls, and this is a fifty-year-old trans woman, so a biological male. Now, is is there a legitimacy to that, or is that pretty? high likelihood that that's a sexual predator or would you need more information is that not enough information to 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 make a judgment because it me. seems suspicious to me well okay agreed I, I don't think it's enough information but certainly regardless of their gender if there is a 50 year old person who is wanting to hang out with younger children um and in the and, change room yeah, I mean, there's definitely some red flags there, regardless of their gender. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's not something. It, it's not something that is sort of a, a normal behavior. Um, yeah, it's concerning. There was a, an episode. Nobody under the age of forty is going to remember this, but the uh, there was a show, Different Strokes, and what a fantastic uh, series it was. Um, and there was a, a pedophile that was portrayed there. I forget who, who played it, but he did a wonderful job. And they showed the grooming process. First, it was come over to play video games. And then it was pizza. And, uh, and it just kind of grew from there. And then uh, uh, Playboy magazines. And um, like it, they showed the process there. And sexualizing kids seems right now to not only be tolerated, but officially promoted. So there are books, and I, I just can't even believe it's true, but I've seen them, sexually explicit children's books in, in the school libraries. Are, are you familiar with this? I've heard about various things, Mark, and yes, I. it's, it's too um, difficult to kind of think that someone would be purposefully writing these these things or even having visual pictures of these things um but i i do know that i, they I think it's i think it's allowed because it's it uh, a lot of these books fall within the lbgt plus um uh category but i don't give a rat's behind uh if if it's uh whether it's straight or gay sex is being portrayed it's irrelevant to me what is relevant is that it's sex. Mm -hmm. Like, like, like it sounds like a Judy Bloom novel, these um, childhood books talking about oral sex and, and in a very descriptive way, like not in a clinical way yeah. whatsoever, but in, um, and, and then 
like, like we're talking about the emotions, talking about the being flushed and the reaction and the excitement and um and doing it in the format of a children's book with mm. like you know like the little engine that could kind of yeah. animation in these books and um it is just beyond me and when anybody speaks up about it says i don't think that's right i don't think mm-hmm. this should be in the school library this is wrong now are books like that just a straight up tool of grooming would you say it seems that well, way to me definitely potentially we've all also um are very aware that this is common in many anime books as well so mm. a lot of children and teens are very much into anime but there's um anime books and anime video games uh where the there's very explicit sexual content that parents, caregivers would not, teachers would not necessarily um, even understand or recognize unless they themselves were, you know, really purviewing the content. So yeah, I agree with you. It's very concerning. And you know, to, to think that a child or teen has the ability cognitively and developmentally to understand um, what's being presented to them, um, it, it what, just, they, what, they can't. What, what could be the impact? Let, let's say, because like, I mean, we're talking primary school. These books yeah. are there. So an eight-year-old is um, from their library, from their school library, sexually explicit talking about oral sex and anal sex and any kind of sex but it's sex in a children's book format okay well the, this is my safe space this is the school where they look after me so this if I, this is where i'm getting the book this must be perfectly fine and perfectly acceptable mm-hmm. so well, like what what, well, what what does that do to make that like to me that makes the kids so much more vulnerable like yeah. wide open to a predator Yeah, well, it is definitely a form of sexual abuse. When there's any kind of material that is shared with a child or teen um, that's developmentally inappropriate and and sexually explicit, that is a form of sexual abuse. Now, are there any laws on the books that um, protect, like, like where's the where's the line where this is child pornography? Yeah. Like is, is there is there a, a is there like a um a very easy to is there a def, definitive line there for like no this isn't a children's book this is child pornography so that it it could be charged for distribution. My understanding is that there's not. Um, my understanding is that the only similarly to movies and videos, there has to be a rating on it that that gets identified, um, whether it's sort of PG or for general audiences. But even that, when it's very subtle and kind of insidious, um, it doesn't always get picked up on. And and your point to your point of it can become very confusing because when a child reads or sees things that are very subtle in that way and they're picking up on those cues um, and it's right out in the open um, that actually is part of even a grooming process uh, because when it's right on the open and nobody else is recognizing it or seeing that it's bad it's like okay well this must be okay Right. Well, but if you find it in a school, it's endorsed. Mm -hmm. Like, is tacit? (coughs) Pardon me. It is tacitly endorsed that this is okay. Am I? Am I wrong in that? I don't think you're wrong. I think it's, you know, a matter of people looking through the material, understanding the material, knowing what to look for, um, and having conversations about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate for children or teens. Yeah. So tell me about some of the services, uh, switch gears here, cause I'm just getting too upset. <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, some, some of the services that little warriors provides, what are some of the programs? Like, so if, if somebody um, uh, had, has it has a child who um, who comes who comes to new, to little warriors? Let's let's talk about that. 
Okay. Well, um, so we have uh, a children's program and our children's program is for eight to 12 year old boys and girls. Um, it's not that children are not sexually abused before the age of eight, um, unfortunately. And, and, you know, to highlight your earlier point, we have known of children and children have come to us who as infants have been sexually abused and um, have had to have reconstructive surgery as a result of that. So let's, uh, let's call it what it is then. Rape. Yeah. As infants. Yes. yes. They've been extremely abused and raped. Yes. Physically. Yeah. Um, Causing massive physical harm requiring yeah. reconstructive surgery. Correct. So that's what I'm saying. Like if we don't, like it's horrible. It's the most horrible thing a person can freaking fathom. But if we don't say it, then people in their minds, the cognitive dissonance is so easy. Right. Yeah. They just go, oh, oh the kid was just fiddled with. Nope. Yeah. No, nope, not just fiddled with. Yeah, no, it's um, it is severe in many, many cases um, of the children that we see. So we have a children's program for eight to 12 year olds. Um, we work with the child and their caregivers. We do not work with um, offenders. That's just not um, within our realm. Uh, we focus very much on supporting children, teens, and families toward their healing. Um, we So our program, we offer four episodes of intensive care, and we research our, our treatment. So we do pre-post measures. We work with the University of Alberta, and we um, also work with an organization out of Toronto that looks at all of our scores with regard to things like PTSD, anxiety, depression, family functioning. And um, Mark, you know, you talk about war and veterans and military personnel um, with PTSD. And um, yes, you know, it's unfathomable the, the things that they've had to experience and that we as a general public have no idea. But the truth is, is many of our children, almost all of our children and teens who come to Little Warriors have very high scores that would be um, very similar to uh, military personnel who have served in, in um, you know, war-torn uh, areas. So well, you, we- Wanda, you bring up a great point, Wanda. Like, uh, one of my earlier episodes, like the first 10 or 20, somewhere in there, I talk about the Trauma Olympics. Apparently, that was a pretty popular episode. But trauma is trauma is trauma. Whether it be childhood sexual trauma, war trauma, the effect that it has on your nervous system, um, it's a neurological injury. And it's all the same. Yeah. Regardless of the, of the modality of that trauma, uh, the the damage to your life, the destruction, um, it's the same. Yes, correct. And and I think it's very difficult for someone to understand that an eight year old um, or a six year old or a five year old could have very severe PTSD. Um, but it it does happen. We are treating those children, um, and the great news um, of our our story and our program at Little Warriors is that our, our program does work. Um, and of course, I very much like to argue for, um, you know, treating children at this age is also prevention. Uh, because oh, yes. like you're saying, a lot of people who have experienced these atrocities as a child who've been raped, don't talk about it until, you know, in into their 40s and 50s. I think um, I just read an article um, from the United States that said that the average age of disclosure, <clears throat> pardon me, for a woman who was sexually abused as a child is 58. Oh. So holding on to and trying to manage through relationships and trying to understand levels of mental health and addiction because of their traumas, um, you know, for 58 years, um, holding on to that, people just don't understand. They don't 
understand the impacts that that has. And, you know, Mark, you telling your story today, I, I'm just really appreciative. And, and I do hope listeners out there um, are able to hear that because I think it's very relatable. And for you to, you know, speak about it, um, when people do that, it allows others to speak up too. So um, thank you for that. And and to that, I mean, that's what our program at Little Warriors is all about, is bringing children together who have had similar experiences so that they can come to this camp like beautiful setting um, where we have very specialized trained staff and therapists and they meet other children and they look at other children and say geez you're pretty cool and you know this happened to you too and they build those levels of understanding and compassion um, within the group and for each other and you know that's where those resiliency factors come into play play and and how important that is for stories of this to be told and understood there's um and it's tough for a lot of people to wrap their head around but trauma can be a gift i see it as a gift um i mean it, everything under the sun right uh, molested from 7 to 12 raped at 17 and then um the the military incident when i was uh 21 so well, 20, just before my 21st birthday. So um, then war trauma and uh, not to mention everything that happened to me as a kid in school and all the violence and all the blood. So you, you, you put it all together, there's a lot. But without that, I would have no credibility to be able to do what I'm doing now with this show. I don't know what episode we're on, 316 or something like that. But because I... I'm able to have this platform and tell these stories in a matter of fact way in uh, cause, cause it's the truth and just be use clear language with no euphemisms and just call things for what they are. Those that hear it, that are keeping the secret is the secrets that make you sick as our mutual friend Theo says, you know, it's the yeah. secrets that make you sick and until you're able to say it to somebody. You don't have to say it out loud to the whole world like I do, but uh, say it to somebody. My wife, when I was 48 years old, was the first one I told. Because for whatever reason, I was ashamed of what happened to me, even though it wasn't my fault. I was seven. Yeah. I was seven, right? There's, 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 there's nothing to be ashamed about. I was seven. Right. You know? <laughs> and uh, I didn't do anything wrong. So for others to hear that, they have to say it out loud to somebody, even if it's to yourself in the mirror, but say it out loud, say what happened, say it to the mirror, say it to your dog, tell it to a turtle. I don't care, but say it out loud with your words. This is what happened to me. And that's the beginning of letting it go so that it doesn't, it doesn't dominate your life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I I agree. And um, to be able to get supports and reach out. And sometimes I, I think people don't necessarily, you know, put put things together. But when you have a scaffolding of numerous traumas in our life, sometimes it that just becomes kind of the norm, unfortunately. And um, sometimes it, it takes certain incidents or episodes or certain relationships, safe, healthy relationships to be able to recognize that, you know, what happened was um, wrong and that, you know, that, that you can still be and should be loved and appreciated and cared for and respected um, even with those childhood wounds. But, you know, when those things happen in childhood, it's really hard to understand that there is often a sense of like something's not right with me or like you said feeling of blame but how how in the world can a seven-year-old be uh, you know uh, blamed for um, being raped but but that is kind of the narrative um, that can happen and without you know getting that support and speaking up and saying what it is um, those tapes become you know 
more and more um, laid down in, in, in our heads uh, about that. And, um, and then it starts taking some time um, when we've had numerous other traumas happen uh, to recognize that those tapes just kind of automatically play and, and that gets hooked into things like drugs and alcohol abuse. And, um, well, it starts, you know, a, it starts a negative feedback loop, right? Um, yeah. when I was in Ottawa, uh, one of the things I was able to, or which speaking gig was it? No, it was at River Creek Casino and, uh, where I got into the childhood part. And, and what I wanted the room to understand is that it actually started with, I was adopted at birth. That's where it started and a sense of insecurity and not belonging, you know, looking because being adopted, I don't even have that genetic link. Right. So mm -hmm. I need to be part of a tribe. Where's my tribe? Where's my tr tribe? And because I, the first place I should get that is my parents. Well, I didn't, I didn't get that sense of tribe from, from my parents. So the first place I could find that sense of tribe turned out to be a predator. And mm -hmm. because of that, but, but it was, I was vulnerable to the predator because I didn't have the sense of tribe with my parents. So if you have a strong connection with your parents, you are much, much, much less susceptible because you will find that connection where that, that tribe, wherever you can find it. So it wasn't with my parents, which made me vulnerable. And then the first place I found that sense of tribe within the family, I was seven and I found that connection. And because that was the only place I could find that connection was how that happened. If I had found it earlier, that would have never have happened. But because that happened from seven to 12, that's what had me vulnerable to being raped when I was 17. I would never would have been raped when I was 17 if I had that strong sense of connection before. So what it becomes starts this negative feedback loop and the trauma begets trauma begets trauma. And, um, uh, and, and that's important for people to understand. So when they say, oh, you're just a junkie. Why? why? No, that's a person who, who is trying to survive. You don't know their story. You can't just dehumanize and diminish somebody like that with a label of you're a junkie. You're a druggie. Why? There's a reason. Not to say that they're not responsible. We're all responsible for our lives. Every one of us, we're responsible for our lives. However, there's a reason. And there's a reason. Would you agree? 100%. 100%. And just, um, you know, Bruce Perry uh, actually wrote a book about this, just understanding that as human beings, if we can see beyond kind of instead of that thought of like, what's wrong with you? It's like, what has happened to you? Which is a very different mm -hmm. perspective that begins to take a little bit more of a compassionate um, approach to understanding why people have made the choices and, and what has brought them to their lives um, when that, you know, continued trauma happens, Mark. Um, and like you said, not to and, say and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even call it choices. Uh, when I was spoke to that group of doctors in Ottawa, one of the previous speakers before I got up there was talking about addiction and is it a choice or is it, what were the two? Is it choice or is it a disease? And it's like, yeah. that's your binary. That That's it. It's neither. Right. Yeah. Like you, you don't choose the drugs. You discover the drugs and go, Oh my God, this is the only form of relief that I have. Right. This is it. Right. So it's the only therapy that they had access to. They don't have mental health. They don't have access to any other connection. Yeah. So uh, when, yeah. when you are in hell, like when you're on fire, you don't care if you're getting pushed, uh, if that fire is getting put out by tar or, or, or by water or, or, or it, it doesn't matter. Just put out the fire. And, right. uh, and that's what these, these, these people are, they, they, they find it's relief. It's relief yeah. and that's it. Well, and I mean, this is a whole different topic, but what you're bringing up, you know, we know that trauma changes brains and yes. for in a, a child who's been raped and um, where there's been, uh, you know, layers of other trauma, there are actual neurological changes that have happened um, that 
create different ability to make decisions, but beyond that physiological um, how, how people kind of experience the world around them. And I know that in Indigenous cultures, <clears throat> they talk about, you know, it takes seven generations to um, shift that genetic code um, for trauma. And, and scientifically, there's a lot of new data coming out around the epigenetics of trauma and how it gets laid down, trauma gets laid down in our genetic structure. So it it is not just a choice. It's not, it, it you know, there's very profound impacts of trauma. Yeah, absolutely. Wanda, I think we're there. Um, thank you so much. How, if people uh, want to donate to support your unbelievably important cause, um, your organization, Little Warriors, to help um, save these kids' lives through treatment, how do they find you and, and yep. how do they donate? Thank you, Mark, for bringing attention to this. So, um, yeah, we are always welcoming donations. We are a not-for-profit. 95% um, of how we are able to serve children come through donations. So that while that's important, we also want to share information and advocate. So we have a lot of information on our website, um, and including donations. And um, we also have a list of supplies if people don't have the financial means, maybe um, there's ways that uh, you can make an impact. So just go to www.littlewarriors.ca. Littlewarriors.ca. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being Thank here and having this conversation with me. And to all the people that are listening, I know this was a hard one. Uh, most of you probably didn't make it through the whole hour that we just had. And I get why. However, if you want to help children, have the courage to share. Because I know if you share something like this, you may be concerned a little bit about some stigma. Maybe uh, you think if I share this, somebody's going to think that this happened to me as a kid. Uh, maybe that's going through your head. Could be. Have the courage to do it anyway. Share this episode. If you don't want to tell your own story, I understand that. But let me tell mine. Let Wanda tell hers. Tell the, let, let the story be told. You don't have to say it, but you can share it. And that lets the story be told, and that helps eliminate the stigma. Stigma kills. Stigma kills, and only through conversation, open, honest, clear conversation, can we get rid of the stigma. Share this show. Share this episode, please. Have these conversations at the dinner table. Have these conversations with your children. If you don't have the conversation with your children, they are vulnerable, and you are failing as a parent. Don't let your kids be vulnerable. Don't be embarrassed. Have the conversation. Is this happening at school? Is this happening with friends? Are you receiving this type of material? Is anybody buying you gifts? Does anybody want to touch you or ask you to touch them? Have the conversations. No matter how awkward they are, have the conversations and protect your children. If you don't, you're failing as a parent. And your children are vulnerable. It's your job. You have to do it. Thank you for tuning in, everybody.